Welcome to Screens of the Stone Age, the podcast where scientists review movies about prehistoric people. My name is Josh Lindell. I'm a grad student studying Neanderthal teeth, and I'm here with my co-hosts. I'm Dr. Kimberly Pomp. I am a bioarchaeologist, so I study the human skeleton, uh, disease, and evolution. And I'm Dr. Ross Barnett. Uh, I study ancient DNA and Pleistocene life. Today we're reviewing... The Flintstones movie from 1994, which is obviously based on the Flintstones TV series from the 1960s. Who wants to summarize this one? Um, I can. It was. I remember it very distinctly from my childhood. I remember when the McDonald's came out with all the toys and stuff. It was all really fun. Um, so it's Fred and um, Wilma Flintstone have their daughter Pebbles, and they are neighbors with. Barney and Betty Rubble and their newly adopted son Bam Bam and Barney and Fred work together and then there's this uh, evil guy who's the boss the MBA they call him and he sets up Fred Flintstone to take the fall in an embezzling scheme and chaos ensues shenanigans it's very interesting for a, a movie heavily marketed to kids that the plot is an embezzling scheme yes that's true <laughs> I thought that was really I'm going to say up front, I really liked this film, and I was kind of shocked when I looked on IMDb and saw it's only got a 4.9, because I thought it was really good, yeah. and you know, I didn't expect that, but also the whole embezzling plot, I thought that was, you know, that was quite subversive, really. You don't expect, usually, to, to see, particularly for a kid's film, uh, a plot which says, you know, guys, actually, having all the money you want isn't the best thing. These guys tend to be mm-hmm. not the kind of people you want to emulate. You want to be the, you know, normal average schmo with uh, with this way hotter than average wife who just makes a, a reasonable <laughs> amount of money and hangs out with his friends and goes bowling. I thought that was quite yeah. nicely subversive. Friendship, love, and being a good person is more important than money. Yeah. I think part partly maybe the reason it's got a low rating on IMDb is that people expect it to be a kid's movie, but it has a lot of like adult themes in it. But the original Flintstones cartoon was never meant to be just for kids either. Like, it was entirely a response to a couple of cartoons that came out from Hanna-Barbera before that that got labeled as too childish, and they wanted to reach out to adult audiences more, kind of like SpongeBob today or something like that. Yeah. And so the Flintstones was, uh, was it the first cartoon to air in prime time? Like, it was totally meant to be for both kids and adults, so... I don't know if it was the Flintstones or the Jetsons that was the first to air. I think the Flintstones was before the Jetsons. Hmm. Um, But anyway, normally we start off with uh, nitpicking the little mistakes, and I don't, I don't know how to do this movie because it's it's only it's only scientific inaccuracies like the whole way through. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe we can't really follow that format today. No, though I have to say, you know, the only thing that I've written down as you know something that slightly bugged me. I could I could roll with you know all the um, you know the dictaphone that was a parrot and uh, you know the garbage disposal that was a pig that was great. All those kind of classic kind of Flintstones technology. But I noticed that when they were working in the in the um, the quarry, they've got metal picks. They were they were digging with mm. with metal instruments. You know, and Flintstones are the Stone Age family, not the not the Bronze Age or the Iron Age family. So yeah, that's everything else I was cool with, but but uh, using metal <laughs> in the flint st- in bedrock, no. I didn't even notice that. Couldn't stand for that. They also write by chiseling on tablets, and I suppose they must be using metal chisels, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So maybe we can just sort of one thing I notice about this movie is that it's really dense with references. Hmm. So maybe we can just sort of run through everything and and point out. Every little thing that we noticed about it that caught our attention. I think it's worth starting right from the beginning uh, to talk about the representation of humans and dinosaurs together because (laughs) the the classic thing for archaeologists to say is that archaeologists don't dig up dinosaurs. Humans and dinosaurs never live together. Uh, For those of us in the field, it feels like this should go without saying, but in real life, a lot of people still actually believe either that archaeologists dig up dinosaurs or that humans and dinosaurs 
ever live together at the same time. We should we should be precise here and say non-avian dinosaurs, obviously. Yes, yes that's another the whole other question of the representation of the dinosaurs without feathers in the movie as well. Yeah. So a lot of people, I don't really know exactly who our audience is because we've just started this podcast. We I don't have any m- metrics on our listeners yet. But there may be people who are listening who might think that uh, dinosaurs have ever lived at the same time as humans or that archaeologists dig up dinosaurs. It's a relatively common uh, sentiment. Uh, I've been teaching a new course on archaeology and pop culture over the the summer term. And uh, one of the things we've been doing is going over statistics about what people think about archaeology. And in the United States, in the recent survey, 41% of people thought that archaeologists dig up dinosaurs, even though they seem to have a pretty good understanding of archaeology otherwise. And uh, I mean, it's it seems, it seems astounding to me that people could think that, but also the point is, you know, we shouldn't shame people for not knowing something. Well... I think it has a lot to do with the religious background in the United States, especially um, because it's that that creationist idea that humans and dinosaurs did live together. God created earth and then everything coexisted at the same time, what, 6,000 years ago. And then the flood um, killed out the dinosaurs. And so if you don't, if you're not paying attention, if you're living your life and just not paying attention to it and you're in an area in the United States where you're watching these TV shows and movies and then there's a muse there's a museum somewhere in is it California that has that teaches that humans and dinosaurs live together? There's the creation museums in Kentucky, I think. Kentucky. And then there's textbooks as well that show it. So like you could see how even if even if you didn't necessarily take that on as fact, but you could see how being in that type of um world where it just seems to be that idea seems to be respected as much as the other scientific idea. So you at least think that it has sway, you know, like, oh, we don't know for sure. Everybody's yeah. opinion counts. And you're like, well, no, because one is wrong. If I, if I could weigh in with the, a European perspective, I mean, definitely there's, there's issues over here as well. But I mean, this is, this is not mainstream religion. This is mostly kind of evangelical American Christianity. It's worth pointing out that yes. Catholicism has zero problem with, um, you know, an old earth and uh, dinosaurs separated from people by 66 million years. That's not an issue with Catholicism at all. Uh, and most mainstream mm-hmm. um, Protestant uh, denominations don't have a problem with it either. It's very much tied into uh, kind of Southern US evangelical Christianity, particularly, you know, books like the Genesis flood and other kind of misinformation that were put out in the, 80s and and uh, and earlier by um, hucksters, I think is probably the the politest way to de- describe it. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's it's a big problem. But I don't think it's as big a problem as perhaps many people in our field think. Uh, it's just that you know the empty vessels make the most noise, and so we we kind of hear the the kind of loudest voices that that tend to um, get the most attention. Yeah. I think there's a flip side of that too, though, that uh, not everybody who believes that dinosaurs and humans live together are actually follow a fundamentalist uh, Christian worldview. It's just that they just never had an education that taught them otherwise, and it's just an idea that exists out there. So I, I don't think we can reduce it to one thing, but I think that one of the takeaways is that, uh, archaeology needs to do a better job of promoting itself without shaming people for not already knowing the things that we expect them to know because the education system doesn't teach them very well. Maybe not archaeology, but paleontology. <laughs> science even, just I mean, science. I, th- I think it's it's kind of unfair to blame archaeologists for not t- teaching people about dinosaurs. It should be paleontologist's job, probably. <laughs> uh, it's true. I mean, I have, I'm coming from the archaeologist perspective, so... Maybe we both need to do a better job of outreach. I would go even a bit farther and say, you know, that uh, people can easily um, become ignorant, not not because they're choosing to, but because they're living in a world where they're saturated with all these um, incorrect ideas. And it's hard to um, filter out which ones are correct and which ones are wrong, especially when both when you don't have the background. And so both seem legitimate. But then when you watch things like, you know, the Discovery Channel and History Channel and all these things that are supposed to be 
communicating science and they have things on there like ancient aliens yeah. and creationist stuff and you know all, all of this stuff that it's packaged and sold as if it's the same as accurate science yeah. and so that is leaving people unable because you know if you if you don't have a science background which is perfectly okay you're going to trust something that's on the discovery channel or the history channel and you're going to think that you're trying to learn things by going and watching this stuff and it's given the same um notoriety as the actual stuff or even more so so you're going to you're going to be prone to believe it and it's not surprising that you're you're believing it so i think there's a lot that goes into it and then even if you're not religious you still see these things as encompassing that same sphere and it's really come to bite us in the ass with uh with covid um yes with the the kind of proliferation of misinformation and um false authority i guess yep well and then when you also think okay well these two ideas are equal because they both have background and then one seems so sure of themselves because say let's take a um a very evangelical religious view on creationism they are very sure of themselves and you go to any scientist anybody who knows anything about science is never going to be sure about anything so who are you going to believe and then then that situates the seeds that you need to be for like that you can be sure about something which then when science is unsure about you know whether there's going to be some side effects with the vaccine then you think it's all bullshit but the real science is what uh is there, yeah. there's always going to be uncertainty because that's science. Anyway, sorry. Obviously, it's a, it's a point for me. <laughs> there's a great Bertrand Russell quote about that, you know, that uh, the problem with uh, the world is that the stupid people are so confident and the intelligent people are so full of doubt. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's it in a nutshell, essentially. Well, it's true. I mean, the first, one of the first thing I always teach my students is, you know, if you ever read something and someone says, it's for sure. I've proven this. This is for sure. There's no argument. Then that's bullshit. That's not. Yeah. That's not science, yeah, right? Like right maths. away, that's the key thing to know. Yeah. Yes. Who knew the Flintstones was going to lead to such a deep conversation? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was so patriarchal too. That drove me nuts. And then what I what I remember realizing was watching the Flintstones and how patriarchal it is with the Fred being having to be the king of the castle and. He has to be um, the one in charge of the house, and yada yada yada. But but Kim, he's a he's a literal caveman. I mean, I think maybe I know, your I know. expectations were. <laughs> <laughs> but I was eleven watching this, and not thinking anything of it, like thinking that that made sense. And I really hope that kids now and in later generations don't understand that why that is the case because like I found it disturbing that when I was a kid that that never questioned me that it that. I thought it was normal that the man ruled the house. Not that my dad did, but I thought it was interesting how the 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 original Flintstones from the 1960s like the song describes them as the modern stone age family. So they've taken modern life of the 1960s and superimposed it on the stone age. Mm-hmm. But for this movie in 1994, they seem to have stuck with that 1960s version of a modern family. So we have this weird combination of a Stone Age family who acts like they're in the 1960s, but it's made in 1994. And I thought it was it was interesting that they've faithfully reproduced the feel of that uh, of that time. Uh, kind of strangely in the 1990s, when I feel like 1994 would have been a pretty would have felt like more of a socially progressive time when you wouldn't be expecting to see these things presented in a movie, and also the the sexual dynamic with Halle Berry, the secretary, with Fred Flintstone, like yes. that was, yeah, that you couldn't was... put that in a movie today. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, and then just also so annoying that she's willing to be bad when a man is showing her attention, and then as soon as another man shows her attention, she's willing to be all of a sudden good. So it's she just follows whichever man makes her feel best about herself, which means she's not actually a character with autonomy. <laughs> I think, for Josh, your point about how it's weird, you know, it's set in the 90s of a, a 60s family uh, living in, in the Stone Age. I, I don't know what it was like for, for you guys, but definitely I remember the, these cartoons still being on at, you know, almost prime time uh, when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there there wasn't like, a, it's not like the, the Flintstones stopped in the 60s and then there was a 30 year gap. And then the film came out. These were kind of repeated again and again. 
and you know you could watch them mm-hmm. every day um, in the eighties and, and early nineties for definite. So you know maybe they they felt that they were kind of uh, constrained that they had to follow that formula or else you know people would be up in arms like like happens today I guess with uh, with any kind of attempt to um, film a, a a kind of film version of 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 a TV series or of a of a book or something. There's always people that are annoyed at any changes that are made. Yeah, like we already mentioned Sonic the Hedgehog in a previous episode, they had to remake, we had had to redo all the animation because people didn't like the design, the new design, they wanted to stick to the original. So I guess that makes a lot of sense. But I, I really liked it. And like you say, I thought it was really dense with, uh, you know, callbacks, I think, to the original series, but also kind of lots of quite cool ideas in there as well that were uh, fun for, for kids and for, for adults. What I loved when I watched it and what I still love is seeing the how well they did at making the Flintstone world come to life, like a three-dimensional yeah. thing. It was so cool. I loved yeah. that. With, with like, uh, you know, the, the mammoth um, sink kind of spray that yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. and the garbage disposal that was organic and, uh, you know, all the rest of it. Um, and it, yeah, yeah it and was, the cars it was, and the vending machines and everything. It, it's almost like, you know... Um, it reminds me a bit of like the Naked Gun, those kind of films where, you know, you can't sort of not watch it for a second because there's so much going on in the background and yes. off to the side of the screen. And so, you know, even right, right from the start, what I thought was really neat and kind of what put me in a good mood to watch the film was when the Universal uh, Globe came up, like right at the beginning of the film with the with the, the credits, you know, the Universal Globe was off Pangea rather than off the, the kind of modern yes. continents. Uh, and, you know, they, they could have set up right from the start okay, we're going to do things slightly differently. You better pay attention. Uh, and it just, I thought it was yeah. really nice that, you know, obviously Pangea is thought like 600 million years ago or something. Uh, it's not Stone Age by any stretch of the imagination, but they've, they've thought, right, we'll, we'll assemble all the continents back together into the original supercontinent and that put that on the <laughs> universal globe. And that, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it's a good the idea. nice thing is that it's it's a relatively accurate looking map of Pangaea, yeah. as far as I know, right? It's yeah, not yeah. like they just made the Earth look like one continent. They they made a real looking Pangaea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's not only references to the original Flintstones cartoon, but there's also lots of references to real science that are all over the place, like Pangaea from like you say 600 million years ago, and then there's dinosaurs and there's all kinds of stuff. But they they reference a lot of real life things that don't make any sense altogether in the same context but there's still references to real things uh so right right from the, those opening credits again you see you sort of fly into bedrock from uh space i think from the that logo and uh you you pass a pteranodon airliner where the flight attendant is announcing that they're going to be landing in bedrock and if you look out the window you'll see uh, the Grand Canyon in 15 million years. So they're acknowledging <laughs> the depth of time that it takes for the Grand Canyon to form. But I had to look up, I had to like try and figure out my timeline, even though I can't do that in this movie because it doesn't make any sense. But like, uh, I had to look up how, when the Grand Canyon actually formed to figure out if we were 15 million years before that. Uh, but apparently the Grand Canyon, the the age of the Grand Canyon is not really securely settled. Do you guys know any more about that than I do? No. no. All I know is that like tying back into our previous comments that uh, I think the national parks were in trouble within the past couple of years for um, putting up uh, kind of information boards at, at the Grand Canyon that kind of bent over backwards to incorporate um, a kind of creationist worldview. Um, and Ugh. people weren't happy hmm. about that. That's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Spreading disinformation. But I'm not surprised that there's not really a, a good... Uh, date on that because you know it's a pretty Im- impressive structure it'd be quite hard to uh, put some hard and fast numbers on there there are certainly studies uh but there's some i think some of them say as little as six million years and there's some that say 20 or 30 million and i'm just i don't my geology background isn't strong enough to know how to make sense of them no me neither uh, there's also quite a few scenes where Fred is reading a newspaper, and the newspaper is obviously chiseled onto a rock. But if you pause it, you can read all of the uh, things on the newspaper. Did you guys take a look at any of those headlines? Yeah. <laughs> they were all relevant, right? Uh, yeah, there's some references to like 90s pop culture, but also a lot of references to uh, 
like real science stuff. So in one of the first ones, there's a reference to the movie Alive, which is based on a real life event so where a plane crashed in the Andes and the passengers had to cannibalize each other to survive. But it was uh, because the airplane's a pterodactyl. <laughs> uh, it was a pterodactyl that crashed in the Andes and then it had to eat all the passengers to survive. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that one. Uh, there's another reference that said uh, uh, Krakatoa erupts west of Java. Yeah. I don't know what timeline that would be, but that's certainly not in line with the origin of the Grand Canyon or no, Pangea like or the Vikings, dinosaurs. Isn't it? Well, Kra Krakatoa erupted in the 1800s. I yeah, it, was it must have earlier than that. I thought it was Viking. No, 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 no. It it must have erupted several times. Yeah. It's the mm -hmm. volcano. So if we're going back over time, I'm sure it's erupted more than once. Because there's that one that put darkness for like two years. What was that one? Uh, probably Krakatoa. I mean, in the eighteen hundred in the eighteen hundreds, it was you know effects found in in uh, seen in London and all the rest of it. Um, and there's mm. the you know the famous um, film Krakatoa. I think it's Krakatoa West, east of Java, but it's actually west of Java or something like that. Even even the film title got it wrong. Um, but I think that was the last <laughs> eruption because you know basically it disappeared because it, it it blew everything. Um, and so now oh, wow. there's it's like a, a volcanic lagoon. I think. Ooh, lovely. There was also another newspaper headline that referenced Peking Man. <laughs> Which is a hominin. Yeah, Peking Man refers to a uh, Homo erectus that was found in uh, Zhukudian Cave in China. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting story because it was found in the, the 20s. And then uh, when World War II broke out, they were trying to smuggle these remains out of China to keep them safe and they disappeared and no one has uh, been able to find them since. It's in somebody's attic or basement. <laughs> there was a story from a few years ago that um, they had possibly been buried somewhere on some military base, which was now like a parking lot in China. And they <laughs> were like doing some construction and they're like, oh, maybe we're going to find a crate full of the original Zhu Kudian fossils. Yeah, it could be. I mean, they in Berlin, they, they buried the Archaeopteryx, the original Archaeopteryx, under a church. They buried it in a crate. So, Same in London. They, they moved a whole stuff, a bunch of stuff out to um, some caves, I think, in the West Country. But what I liked about the um, newspapers as well is that there's quite often they had uh, headlines relating to the, the film. And they, instead of uh, having photos, they had... You know the actual cartoon outlines from the the sixties cartoon yes. of, of Fred Flintstone. That was a nice yeah. touch. Yeah, yeah, uh, that was really cute. Well, one more newspaper headline that I'd written down was uh, "Pyramid Park opens in Kairok," <laughs> and it was written by King Tusk. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I think this is one of the best um, casted movies. Yeah, you definitely. know, like you take something so beloved that people know so well, and you cast it. You're always going to get something a bit wrong, but this one was perfect. Yeah, John Goodman is sort of Fred Flintstone. He gets it right, and Rick Moranis as uh, as yeah. Barney is it's perfect. Yeah, and Kyle MacLachlan as the as the the baddie. He's good. I mean, he's he yeah. doesn't get a chance to play a baddie, I guess, often enough because he's he's quite uh, menacing in it. Yeah. Well, and Wilma and Betty, and then um, Wilma's mom, who is Rizzo, right, from Greece. They're, it's all good. No, no, it's Elizabeth no. Taylor. Are you sure? Because yeah. IMDB yeah. Says, lists both on there. They li list Elizabeth Taylor and then the Rizzo lady. Really? Maybe she's in the sequels. Oh, maybe. My understanding was this was Elizabeth Taylor's possible last role? Yeah. yeah oh, okay. Yeah. No, it's definitely Liz Taylor. Uh, we should say Rosie O'Donnell as Betty Rubble and Elizabeth Perkins as Wilma Flintstone. Uh, like I said, Kyle MacLachlan and Halle Berry as the villains. Uh, it's a big cast. It was a, mm -hmm. a great cast for this movie. Now, I saw this as a child, and in my memory, forever, the Olsen twins were pebbles. Right? But they weren't. They weren't. I know. I saw that too. I was like, I thought the Olsen twins. I, in, I totally thought they were. It wasn't. It was uh, okay, just so it wasn't kid. just me. I, I, my whole life, I thought it was the Olsen twins, but <laughs> I guess I haven't seen this movie since I was a kid. I don't know, yeah. I think just any little girl that looked like that was an Olsen twin at that time. 
Uh, well, they were twins. Uh, they haven't done anything other than this movie. And also the boys that played Bam Bam were twins uh, from Iceland, actually. Mm. And they also haven't done anything other than this movie. So that's hmm. a fun fact. I don't know. I was really impressed with, for it being 1994, with how everything looked like the dinosaurs and the mammoths and everything moving. And I guess they're all puppets. But it was pretty good for 1994. Yeah. I mean, it would be I, I good not- for now, even. I was wondering about that. I mean, because they are good, but they're not kind of as good as Jurassic Park, which came out the year before, I think. So I mean, I'm sure. No, but I don't think they're trying to be, though, right? Like, there's no. still that cartoonish True. bit feel to it. Yeah. They were uh, done by Jim Henson, right? Oh, okay. okay. That makes sense. And, like, they didn't try and get the dinosaur species correct, because I think the one no. that, um, the one that Fred rides for work is supposed to be a brachiosaur because it's got two nostrils on top of his head, but its body is more brontosaurus-y, right? Like, it's not brachiosaurus Well, he calls it a bronto, doesn't he? He calls it his bronto crane. Yeah, but it's got nostrils on the top of its head, which is not brontosaurus slash apatosaurus. Oh, wow. uh, so what's the deal with brontosaurus right now? Well, we should say, are, how how big into dinosaurs are you guys? Because... The reason I got into archaeology is because I love dinosaurs me as a too. kid, yeah. confusingly enough. I know, me too. I, I still <laughs> regret not, not pursuing paleontology more. So Brontosaurus was a mistake made by during Cope, Cope and Marsh's Dinosaur Wars, where they were both rushing to name species. One of them messed up. Was it Cope, Ross? Was uh, it Marsh? One of them know. messed I can't, up. I can't remember. They were just rushing to name all these species. Yeah, because it was like a race who could name the most species. And um, so Brontosaurus was a mistake. Either it was the wrong head on the wrong, like a head and skeleton mismatched and they called it Brontosaurus or it was put on the wrong end or something like that. And then, um, so we knew Brontosaurus as a kid and then it came out that it wasn't actually a true species. So then the closest that we would consider as a Brontosaurus was actually an Apatosaurus. But then now somebody has named an actual dinosaur a long neck dinosaur brontosaurus just to try and bring back the name is that's as far as i can understand yeah that, that's i think it was 2007 well. that it came back yeah so in 2007 brontosaurus came back but for a while there was no brontosaurus taxonomy is fun and confusing <laughs> yeah that's the story i tell on all my dates <laughs> great <laughs> <laughs> well the cope and marsh wars was fascinating yeah. There's a book on it called The Gilded Dinosaur. Oh, I've got um, that book. Which is kind of yeah. It it describes it quite well. And it just I just can't wait for them to come up with a really good movie with it. Although I just don't I, want them to destroy the story. Coming, I think there's Such one coming story. out soon. Is I think, there? Um, there's one in production. Yeah, let, let me quickly Google oh, that. That would be so good. I hope they do it justice. Because it's one of those like life is a better story than fiction type things. Because all sorts of crazy stuff went on, didn't it? Like dynamiting each other's uh, vines and professional jealousy yeah, and, and all the rest. pranking each other. Like setting up f- fake fossils for the other one to to find and then potentially um, yeah. publish on to try and embarrass them. And and there's no heroes. I mean, they're both as bad as each other. Yeah. I was so disappointed, though, with um, the movie Ammonite on Mary Anning. Oh, have you seen it? I really hope they don't do it. Yeah, it's so bad. It has nothing to do oh. with her fossils or her. It's a love story that they've tried to push this love story into it. All right. God forbid a story be told about a woman that's not somehow sexualized. Hmm. For our listeners, Mary Anning is, um, was a fossil hunter paleontologist back in Victorian England. Um, she wasn't allowed to be part of the Royal Society because she was a woman, even though she discovered the plesiosaur and the ichthyosaur. And she is also who you're singing about when you say she sells she s- seashells on the <laughs> seashore. God, I've never been good. It's easy for you to say, Kim. <laughs> I can't even do it once, let alone multiple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just looking up. And apparently there was in 2013, um, they were set to do a film that, about the Bone Wars with Steve Carell and James Gandolfini. Um, but I'm guessing since oh, James Gandolfini is dead, that's not happening anymore. Um, so it might it might still be kind of on the blacklist, um, waiting to get made. It's a shame. Uh, yeah. What other cool kind of um, little kind of Easter eggs were did you guys find in the film? Because I think the one that I liked the best was uh, when they get money out from the ATM and when they they're dealing with money in Bendrock. It's uh, these little round um, discs 
which have a kind of five bold symmetry, which is the fossil known as sand dollars. Uh, and I thought that was really, yes. it's never mentioned, but if you, if you know your no. fossils, you know that sand dollars are these little kind of flat sea urchins. They're quite common on the uh, American coasts. And the, the, the idea that they'd have fossils for money called sand dollars was great, I thought. Yeah. My favorite, I think my favorite joke wasn't really an Easter egg, but my favorite joke is when uh, Barney and Fred are fighting and Wilma's trying to talk Fred into like not being a jerk. He's like, why do I need him as a friend? There's 4,000 other people in this planet. <laughs> <laughs> There's so, so many like small things like that. There's a quick reference to Neanderth uh, Neanderthals. Yes, um, that they wouldn't let them in the club anymore. <laughs> kind of a weird joke because it's it's kind of like like racist like, uh, racist yeah, yeah it's like we don't let them in the bowling alley anymore yeah. like uh, i don't know that's i know it's kind of a weird thing um wilma's mother uh is telling her at some point about all the sacrifices she made for her and then she yes. lists all the sacrifices <laughs> uh, lambs yes. oxen your My brother, brother. <laughs> jerry <laughs> <laughs> so funny <laughs> Fred also says that his uh, father ate red meat every day and he lived to the ripe old age of 38. <laughs> 38. Yep. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of a misconception because the, um, uh, the, the short life expectancies that we talk about in the past are not so much that people didn't live to old age, but it's because of the high uh, uh, infant mortality rate, right? So yeah. if you survived through childhood, you'd probably survive you know, into your 50s or 60s, yeah. right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were old people. The problem is, is that, w so we can accurately age people's skeletons up until they're fully de adults. So the development, developmental stages that you go through are quite um, good to be able to estimate age. But then once we're all grown and we've reached everything is grown, we're adult, then the only way you can age a skeleton is by deterioration. And everybody deteriorates at different rates. So our ability to estimate age in adults is not very good. And generally, we can only get it to be 10 or 15 year ranges, you know, someone 25 to 35 or something. So anytime you're watching CSI, and they're like, this is a 36 year old female, that's can't do that. You'd be like, that's this is a, somebody who's between the age of 25 and 40, possible female. And then as soon as you kind of get to this point, like where we think it's probably mid 40s or 50s, um, it almost just becomes impossible to then be able to do decades past that. So someone who, you know, generally what we'd say is this person is over 45 or this person's over 50 and that could encompass someone who's 50 that could encompass someone who's 75 and the point is is that everybody because we're all doing different things we all have different genetics different injuries all this stuff that it diets. starts to become different diets it's not systematic anymore so we can't put it into categories um so we don't really know exactly how old people got the assumption is that they probably would live old old enough until the disease or something got them. Um, but the average age of death is younger because of the kids. Aren't there, aren't there some that are clearly like really kind of almost, you know, I guess it's called senile individuals. I'm thinking of like the, the skulls from Dimnisi the, um, in Georgia of the um, early hominids there where like one of them's like almost completely edentulous. He's got no teeth left, but his jaw has mm -hmm. kind of resorbed the roots. And so he looks like, you know, a yes. classic kind of, old 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 man with with no kind of teeth and a, a kind of um sunken face but still obviously survived that by you know being fed by other members of the group or something like that yeah and there's people um there's older people that you know their body is completely arthritic and they have no teeth and they obviously were quite old and frail and then somebody was taking care of them but again we can't we can't necessarily say how old someone would be in order to have all their teeth gone because yeah. there is before modern dentistry um between agriculture and modern dentistry dental disease was rampant mm -hmm. right um before agriculture dental disease wasn't that much so um it's hard to say but yeah you may not yeah. you may have lost your teeth young <laughs> But probably not. It, there's no reason to assume that people weren't living into later decades if they could survive everything else. There's also a whole uh, scene where they go to Cavern on the Green, which is a pun on Tavern on the Green, which is a famous restaurant in New York Central Park, right? I've never been to New York. I've been to New York, but I'm not that fancy, so I don't know. <laughs> 
uh, Futurama made the same joke like 10 or 20 years later where they go to Cavern on the Green yeah. in New New York. <laughs> uh, so, so they call it Cavern on the Green, but it's not on the green because there's no grass because it's the Stone Age. That's another sort of a side <laughs> tangent there is that the Simpsons uh, uh, interprets the Stone Age as the environment being entirely stone <laughs> yes. instead of just tools being made of stone yeah the flintstones but, not the simpsons oh the the flintstones i always i have the simpsons in my head constantly <laughs> uh because the the simpsons is it owes so much to the the Flint, flintstones yeah. i have yeah. the simpsons in my head because it owes so much to the to the flintstones I, I still can't even she sells she sells on the seashore <laughs> <laughs> the what was i talking about the Flintstones interprets the Stone Age as the environment being mostly stone, whereas Stone Age just refers to the culture of making tools out of stone, which is, uh, like I said, a tangent. Mm -hmm. But uh, they go to the cavern on the green, which is not on the green. It's on some sort of a hill, and it's also not a cavern. It seems to be a megalithic structure made to look like Stonehenge, which is another reference. Mm -hmm. And playing there is a band called the BC 52s, <laughs> uh, played by the real life B 52s. And uh, also, they have menus there, which are again chiseled on rock, and you can pause and read the whole menu. Did you guys do that? No. <laughs> the menu has a Saurus salad, a Bronto steak, which is a classic uh, Simpson uh, <laughs> <Flint> stones. <laughs> we should, uh, we should, uh, do some archaeology episodes of the Flintstones on this show. Uh, the Simpsons <laughs> on this show. Oh my god. <laughs> I can't sort them out in my head. We know what you meant. <laughs> uh, Bronto steak. Tr uh, blackened trilobite. Nice. Uh, trilobites are a uh, classic index fossil, which how old are trilobites? Like 500, 500 million? million? Yeah, they're yeah. yeah. And then there's a wine. I, I don't know my fancy French wines, but this is this is quite the pun here. Paul Masonry Cavernet Stone Vignon. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, there's a chocolate mammoth for dessert. Mm. I guess before the moose was invented. Yes. <laughs> there's also uh, a literal Jurassic Park, which is a kiddie park where the kids play on uh, dinosaur rides. <laughs> And the uh, airline where you fly on those uh, pterodactyls is called Triassic World Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all the references that I've written down in my notes here. Did you guys have anything else? No, I don't that, think so. That's it, I think. I'm sure there's tons more if you kept watching it again and again. But one thing I noticed, you, know, like, you guys were t talking about how you know ev everything's quite deserty and stony. I'm assuming it was filmed somewhere in the kind of California deserts because I thought I recognized some of the background as th those kind of famous rocks that um, Bill and Ted reference in, in Bill and Ted films, which is also referenced in Bill and Ted as being the, the rocks that uh, are in Star Trek where uh, Captain Kirk fights the lizard guy, the um, whose name I've forgotten. But it, it, did that, did you guys notice that as well? Were they the same kind of classic Californian rocks that were a backdrop to so many um, Star Trek episodes. So that makes you wonder if there's just a trailer somewhere on the the lot that has that always permanently there, or if it's an actual I, I think it's a, a, a real kind of spot, but you know, within very easy commuting distance from Hollywood, that they could use it yeah. to be an alien planet um, for, for Star Trek or something. It would be good fun to go cosplay there then. Hmm. I, I assumed it was the same uh, the same place where they filmed uh, the early Star Trek episodes as well. So uh, maybe I'll look that up and add it in the show notes later. Yeah. So Ross, is this finally one that you liked? Yes. Yeah, definitely. I did, and um, you know, I didn't really expect to, but then I was kind of put in the right mood by just right from the start with the the kind of Universal Pangaea uh, globe. I was like, oh, all right, okay. <laughs> And then it, it won me over, not with just with all the kind of dad jokes that it had in there, which he, <laughs> he kind of got. Um, but also, I really liked that, you know, it was it was quite, it was recognizably Flintstones, like the, the cartoon I'd watched as a, as a kid. I'd never seen it before. Yeah. I'd never seen this film before. But I could recognize, you know, lots of the motifs. But then also just yeah. kind of quite how subversive it was that, you know, th these the, the whole plot point 
revolves around them trying to set Fred up as a as a kind of fall guy, him working out what's going on, uh, and kind of rejecting the the role that they want him to play of being this guy that gets all all the money and uh, you know can do whatever he wants, but buy whatever he wants, and, and be the kind of big shot. Whereas it just brings him nothing but disappointment and pain, and he just wants to go back to being the guy that rides his Bronto crane and goes bowling with uh, with uh, Barney at, at the weekends. And mm-hmm. I thought that was nice. And there's we could do with more films that that have that kind of overarching message that you know money doesn't buy happiness. That it's about kind of family yes. and friends and um, those are the important things. You know what? The story made sense to me as a kid, but on this watching, uh, the villain's scheme makes absolutely no sense. So uh, to clarify what the scheme was, the reason they set up Fred was that um, Kyle, Kyle McLaughlin, is that his name? Yeah, yeah. And Halle Berry wanted to set up an employee as the fall guy so they could embezzle a bunch of money and have him take the blame. Uh, in order to figure out who to do, who to choose, they gave all of the employees an aptitude test, and then they were going to choose the one who scored highest on the aptitude test. Yeah. And Fred Flintstone actually scored the lowest, uh, but Barney uh, needed to pay him back for the money he lent him so that it, they could adopt a child. So he switched tests with him. So Barney actually was the smartest one, but he gave... Fred his test and then they chose Fred because Fred scored the highest because he actually had Barney's test okay now the in order for their plan to work out they needed the stupidest person so that he could be stupid enough to sign all the documents without reading them and knowing what was going on but the way they planned their test in the first place was they were going to choose the smartest person which doesn't make any sense the one that understood all the economics and stuff, because that's what Barney was like, well, when he asked Fred questions to prove that he didn't know them, right? It was all economic yeah. questions. Yeah, exactly. So if, if Barney had actually scored highest and they'd actually chosen Barney, he would have just read the documents and known what was going on and then being like, I'm not going to sign this. You're embezzling money. <laughs> yeah. And then the plan wouldn't have worked. So it didn't make any sense at all. No, you're absolutely nope. right. Another thing is the end of this movie gets really, really dark. When they when the employees find out that uh, Fred was responsible for firing everybody, they form a lynch mob and they have him hung up on a tree with a noose. That's dark. Like even in the 1960s, <laughs> yeah. people wouldn't lynch their employer for firing them, would they? Like that's super dark. Well, mm-hmm. they're not just employer though. He was one of them. He's betrayed them. Still, it's <laughs> it was pretty dark. <laughs> yes. Remind me never to fire you, Kim. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> not only that but uh kyle mclaughlin's plan at the end to once he's figured out to try and escape is to kidnap the children and set up uh, a huge complicated industrial rube goldberg machine to murder them with industrial machinery on a timer to try and get away and that's dark but that's i mean that's kind of a theme in 80s and 90s stuff quite a lot is that a lot of people just will quite easily be okay with killing children. It's kind of a theme that goes throughout. Now, now you've said it like that, Josh, it does seem quite dark, but I think when I was watching it, I, I kind of, I, I just sort of tuned into the kind of cartoon sensibility of it. It was very much like, you know, Tom and Jerry and the classic kind of Hanna Barbera cartoons where there is a lot of violence, which is kind of consequence free. Like you, you never think that, you know, when, you know, Fred gets sat on by by his Bronto crane, or they they uh, you know get buried under you know tons of, of rock. It never has any consequences, um, and I, I think maybe that's what they were going with here. Which, but you're right. I mean, it does hit slightly differently when it's live action as opposed to cartoon. But it, it felt like they were going for that kind of cartoon um, morality where you know that everyone's going to get away fine, and even if even if they do go through the the kind of mincing machine. They'll just sell tape them back together and they'll be fine again. <laughs> it's it's also hilariously absurd because in the lynching scene, they're gonna lynch Fred at first, and then Barney Rebel pulls up in an ice cream truck because he saw a crowd and he wanted to sell <laughs> some ice cream. And then when they find out that he's friends with Fred, they string him up as well, but they keep buying ice cream from him while he's got a noose around his neck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, you know, they're getting ready to kill him. And then someone comes up and says, I took this ice cream cone and yeah. hands him some money. And he's like, I can't break a 20. Yeah. And then the other guy was like, did you have lemon? 
And he's like, check in the bag. <laughs> yeah. So it's dark, but it's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't feel particularly dated. I mean, that that's, I think that's one of the benefits of it being very much a kind of callback to the 60s cartoon in the 90s. It doesn't feel particularly like a 90s film. Um, it, it feels, you know, like a, like a 60s cartoon again. And it has that, that kind of ageless, um, appeal so it's it's still quite funny now I, I find myself laughing at some bits is there a second film because i remember bam yeah. bam and pebbles getting married but i don't know if that was cartoon or There's, real uh, viva rock vegas right maybe that's the one that uh because yeah the rizzo from greece does look a lot like elizabeth taylor oh maybe she's in the second one i also distinctly remember barney being played by a baldwin and i think that's from the second one. Oh yeah mm. they changed cast completely is it still John Goodman? No. No? Mark Addy, Steph, Stephen oh, Baldwin, Kristen Johnson. King, King Robert Baratheon is uh, this Fred Flintstone in the, in the second one. That's right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A Game of Thrones. Yeah. We might have to watch, wait to watch that one or else I'm going to be too judgmental that it's this, a different cast. <laughs> so it sounds like we all really like this movie, even though there's nothing remotely factual about any of it yeah. yes but if you're going for this to the symptoms for something factual then you're going to the wrong place flintstones i got you doing it now too <laughs> did i say simpsons yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> well you know what both hold <laughs> actually simpsons oh, is probably way more accurate how does it compare to encino man because that's our metric that's our gold standard it's it's not quite Encino Man, but I think it's definitely up there. I mean, it's maybe Encino Man yeah. and then Flintstones. I think this one is more family oriented. Encino is more teenage oriented, but yeah, I think they're both good. I really think the problem is that we're just '90s kids and we <laughs> like all the early '90s movies. It could yeah, be that. I'd be, I should maybe show it to my kids and see what they think. But I, I don't think they, they wouldn't have yeah. any <laughs> reference point for it because they've not seen the cartoons. Whereas we had all, I guess, seen the cartoons before we saw the film. So yeah, and that was one of the cool parts of seeing that world come. Yeah. To life, right? There's also another for the second one, the one we were just talking about, about Viva, Viva Rock Vegas. So the B 52s do the Flintstones theme tune in the first one. For the second one, it's the Wu Tang clan that do uh, the official really? song for it. Yeah. I've met them. Well, I've met two of them. Oh, right. I, I forgot yeah. that you're a big uh, Wu Tang <laughs> I'm not, fan. But they were at a, I was at a hotel for a wedding and they were there. Which ones did you meet? And. Uh, Jizza. Okay. And cool. um, I don't I don't remember the other guy. I don't really actually listen to them, but the other guy was one of the lead singer guys. Cool. He was more just waiting for Jizza to, to stop. Yeah. So the, the Wu-Tang do the Viva Rock Vegas song, which is called Gravel Pit, I think. Yeah. Fun well, fact. he was... Okay. So I hope Jizza doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but so they had just come back from a concert and he was drinking one of those giant Jack Daniel things. With a straw. So he had a straw in it and was drinking it like it was a cup. Wow. And, and my roll. sister was holding a bouquet of flowers from the wedding. And he just leaned in and bit one flower. And then, like, like he chomped the flower and then, like, stood back up and then just spit out the petals. It was a weird night. <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> <laughs> what a story. <laughs> yeah. He was also very sweet and respectful the next uh, do we have any final thoughts on the Flintstones movie? It was good. Worth checking out, I would say, if you've yeah. not seen it. Thanks to David Bach for designing our cover art. You can see more of his work at dkbach.com. Screens of the Stone Age is supported by the Paleoanthropological Society of Canada. Find out what Canadian paleoanthropologists are working on at pasc-scpa.ca.